Hello, this is Adrian Shepard with Springtime and Nations. I'm here with my friend Henry today to talk about some Civil War movies, and not the kind of Civil War movies most people are familiar with, like Glory or Gods and Generals, which are around the Civil War narrative that it was a holy crusade against evil. We're going to be exploring three movies that touch on elements of pacifism, resistance to conscription, and one where the protagonist is an ex-Confederate on the run from Union authorities. So Henry, without further ado, let's try to talk about these movies chronologically. So let's start with Shenandoah, which came out in 1965. Can you tell us just a little bit about the setting and the plot of that movie? So uh, Shenandoah is uh, set in Virginia. I believe in uh, the Shenandoah Valley uh, reference in the title. And I think it's like around like late 1864, maybe because like the Union starting to like encroach into the area, which it had like during other various points, but like really was starting to heat up in 1864. So and it, it's focused on a, a family patriarch, a farmer in the Shenandoah Valley with, like, a lot of children. And uh, he doesn't own slaves, and, like, he's sort of, like, a, a centrist. Like, he doesn't want, like, them involved in the Confederate Army, and he doesn't think, like, they should be involved until it gets to their farm. Yeah, I think uh, from our trifecta of movies, this would be the... It's the anti... It's the anti-war movie from the Confederate perspective. Uh, although certainly the Union is not portrayed very positively either. Right, yes. Uh, I would say, like, obviously, like, yeah, I don't think, like, either side is uh, portrayed particularly well or, like, or uh, particularly well or, like, particularly badly. If anything, like, they kind of, like, almost want to show, like, the Union in a more bad light because, like, the Union just takes their, like, horses or, like, they kind of, like, just threaten to, like, steal their stuff or, like, like take it for the war. While, like, the Confederate Army doesn't, like, outright, like, say they're going to steal their uh, supplies for the war. Yeah, the Confederates are trying to apply social pressure, more or less, uh, during during the movie, whereas... The Union, and not even simply Union soldiers, but some kind of uh, federal government supply officials are uh, confiscating, quote unquote, aka stealing, as the the patriarch notes, uh, their horses that they they need to run their farm with. Um, yeah, the, the the Confederacy is portrayed as not positively. Um, there is a positive or semi-positive uh, union. The, the, the general in the area is portrayed as sort of like an honorable man, but the, the federal government just in general is portrayed as pretty corrupt. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely not, not pro any one side. In fact, it's, it's really kind of an anti-government movie in general. Right, yes, I would say that. I would say like, uh, it, it's anti-government, like, to to the degree that it can be, like, it feels like it's sort of portraying, like, the Confederates as, like, very neutrally, like, neither, like, positively or, like, negatively. It does, uh, obviously, it does show how, like, the Confederate society is, like, pressuring his sons to join. And, like, I think they might, like, do the classic thing of, like, calling, like, one of them yellow at one point because, like they're not joining the army and and one of his sons like clearly does want to join the army and eventually does join the army i think it was like his oldest son it's funny um the uh the the, the patriarch is not really portrayed as many like there have been pacifist movies uh made uh, in the recent past, like uh, Hacksaw Ridge. And I think in general, pacifism is seen as uh, a bit of a religious conviction or religious-based conviction. In this case, the patriarch is sort of, uh, he's not only skeptical of uh, 
states, not just the federal government, but the state of Virginia, but also seems to be skeptical of religion and the role uh, the clergy plays in pressuring his uh, his family to support the war. Uh, yes, he does. He seems to have a very odd relationship with religion because he does like say a grace every night, but he also says that like he he like specifically says not to thank God for like his harvest because like we planted it, we like reaped it, we sowed it, or whatever. We did all the work, but but he also goes to church and takes his family to church though. I think like one of the times or maybe like the other times too, at least the first time he goes to church, it seems like he's a little bit late too. So like, that's kind of interesting that like he, he goes to church, but like seems to not care too much about arriving on time, I guess. Yeah. He seems to be doing it out of obligation to his, his late wife. And he is the, uh, he is really the, um, the real head of the household because there is no there is no mother for for his um well what is it four or five children adult adult to adolescent children that he has on his farm yes yeah, so and he seems to have like pretty a pretty firm hand like he does um uh, like he does like say that like he taught them to always say what what's on their mind and everything but like when the oldest son who wants to join does say like he wants to join the Confederate Army. Like he like says, Well, if I knew like you were going to make a speech about that this, then like maybe I wouldn't have like brought that up about like always speaking your mind or something. Yeah, there was a, that like round table discussion was kind of funny. Um not only because of like the lay skeptic. I mean he kind of he comes off as a very like enlightenment, like uh sort of like deist or kind of like jeffersonian like he sort of believes in religion but not exactly and of course he's like individualist rights whatever but there's also like a discussion like a philosophical discussion about so like slavery during that discussion and i think it's funny that uh while it's clear that he's not interested in slavery his justifications are very like practical and like the the positions of his sons, who I assume have just absorbed his opinions, at least you know when he's when he's uh, when he's like agreeing with them, one can assume like they kind of got it from him. Like this idea that slavery is bad because you should do your own work. It's also very like Jeffersonian, like yeoman pilled. Sure, yeah, it's very like prag pragmatical and very like individualist and like you should do your own work like yes ye o men pilled it's also like it seems like he's like kind of coaching them to just like regurgitate like what he's saying which is like kind of ironic obviously given that like oh like you should always speak your mind and think for yourself but like like especially his younger children which i guess is like understandable but like it seems like they're kind of just like parroting back what they've heard like, it kind of seems like he almost expects them to, like, parrot back his opinions. Yeah, in some ways, this is, I mean, I think it's an interesting concept to, like, okay, so his radical isolation, like, he, he comments that, like, until, like, the union, like, is literally, like, on their land, they're not going to care. Sure. Right? That it's none of our business. Uh, yeah, and, and it's also, like, unclear. Like, obviously, he never explicitly states what he means exactly by that. But it's unclear if, like, he thinks it would be justified to join the Confederate Army at that point when they're actually on their farm and attacking them. Or if, at that point, like, they should just be acting as, like, free actors defending their own farm and not caring about the war, the, the broader war. But it almost sounds like you could interpret it as, like, him saying it, it would be okay to join the Confederate Army if they're on your farm or something. Right. I mean, I remember uh, during one of the occasions that the Confederates uh, come around to the homestead and they're saying, like, oh, Virginia needs all their, their sons. He's saying, like, this is my son. You know, I raised him. The state didn't, like, give me, like, breast milk to feed to feed him, you know? Like, he's he's basically... I mean, 
isolation. I think this is a very, and I don't know exactly what the screenwriter was going for here, but it it is kind of like isolationism and the concept of like a man's home is his castle, like fits in very neatly. Like he rules his like his like family, right? But right. everyone else, like, it's, like, not his business. So his very, like, kind of, like, like, he's not, he's very hands-on within his own family, right? And then hands-off for everything else. Which I think is a good, like, way to think about, uh, you know, isolationism as, like, a, a pure, coherent, like, philosophy. Right, yes. One thing I did think about during the movie a little bit, like, I tend to think about, like, I don't know, like, the historical context or, like, I guess, like, realism or whatever. And, like, I know it's, like, a fictional movie, obviously, from the 60s, and it's, like, Jimmy Stewart and all this. But it, I did think a little bit, and, like, maybe this is, like, a little bit too much of, like, a meta-analysis or something, but I I did think a little bit about how... Uh, how likely like somebody with his views like would have been in this area. Like, of course it only takes one, like it's only one family, but I think like the Shenandoah was like, generally speaking, like pretty pro Confederate and also like, and also specifically not having any slaves, like how likely that would be like, I like, yes, like there were probably some farmers of his wealth who didn't have slaves. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I feel like obviously most farmers of like his, wealth in like that area in the Shenandoah area probably would have had at least a few slaves. Yeah, and of course there is a slave at least uh in the movie and his his bondage is not uh shown as anything particularly egregious. Although I think it's it's worth mentioning that uh his emancipation is is portrayed very positively as well. You know, like he's like forget the name of the slave but like uh one of the the girls uh from from um uh, from the farm uh basically tells them you know you can do whatever you want you, you know you can go anywhere right because once he hears he's free or he has been freed and then he kind of just like goes off on his own he's not really sure what to do but he's he's very like happy about it right yes Yes, it's, I guess, like, the movie as a whole obviously doesn't show slavery a lot. Like, there's one young slave, and he's, it's not, he's not, like, portrayed as, like, being particularly burdened by it, as you said. But you also, like, it's also true, as you said, like, his emancipation is shown as, like, being very positive. I think, obviously, like, that's, like, like, the one the like most like obviously positive thing shown about the North and Union and like yes in the movie. Yeah, uh, any other thoughts before we uh we'll we'll say whether or not we think it was a, a worthwhile movie and then um then we'll move on. Um I guess, like, we could, if you want to, we could talk about the train scene, or do you think that's, like, worth talking about? Or... Oh, with the prisoners of war? Being yes. uh, afraid? Yeah, yeah, you know what? The, yeah, I, I suppose to a certain extent that's uh, that's worth talking about. I mean, uh, why, why don't you uh, why don't you go into it? Sure. From what I remember, uh, the patriarch, the Jimmy Stewart main character, he he sort of, like, goes like he kind of becomes like a commando actually it feels like like a 50 year old commando rugged individualist or something because he just like goes and like frees frees the prison confederate army prisoners and like doesn't he like isn't there like a likening of it to like general emancipation or something too or like I'm trying to remember. I almost. I think there was. That. I think there was a bit of an allusion to that. Yeah. Yeah, there was almost like a joke or a clip about like how like they're being freed too or something. But like, and then like, they also like decide to like 
they're like deciding whether to blow up the union train and supply route and they decide like yes we're gonna blow it up but also we're going to like tell everybody to surrender the war is over it's like obviously that's like one of like the most like epic base like centrist joker moments in the film of like <laughs> like like it's like really like over the top yeah like both sides were dumb or something like only true epic gang tokers understand i don't know yeah i, I that is uh that's funny and it also uh it kind of shows like what we were talking about oh you know what is the possibility that you know if it was on his territory like that he would like join the confederacy or not or I mean, it seems like he's the answer is sort of yes, right? Or at least, I mean, because like his his like child has been captured, right? That he right, is, like, and I mean, it seems into his own hands. Yeah, yeah, he seems to have like a very pragmatist like view of it. Like, it seems like the reason he wouldn't at this point is that like he knows the war is over, and like obviously, like the Confederacy and the South are going to lose. So like. It's just like best to surrender as like quickly as possible at this point. Yeah. Like, yeah, to like end bloodshed, lives being lost, etc. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, I remember you were a little skeptical about this movie, given that it had Jimmy Stewart in it and it's from 1965. <laughs> so, did, were, was your. Uh, were your expectations uh, met? There, were they exceeded? Did they fall short? I guess I would say they were. Though I will say, like, like you said, like I kind of like. There, there's exceptions, of course. There's like lots of great all of, all of pre uh, code movies, like Hayes Code and all that. But like a lot of times during the Hayes Code period of Hollywood, it, like I don't know, like some of those movies. I feel like are a little bit stiff and uh, like particularly, uh, I don't know. They kind of feel like a machine put them out sometimes even more so than like other kinds of movies. But I, it, it exceeded expectations, I would say. But then again, like sometimes I have like low expectations about like the cult Hollywood code era of movies. Mm -hmm. I would honestly not, not necessarily put it on the code necessarily as much as like the studio system was in its heyday at the time as well. Sure. Yeah. No, there were multiple reasons. Of course I was just like, the code is just like an easy, it, it's an easy uh, way to like describe the time period. That's like the main reason I said it, but also like, you know, there's like kind of a cultural libertarian like thing there if not cultural libertine as some would say i don't know right no i agree uh certainly it, generally speaking um but yeah if i had to I, it's not a bad movie um i do not think it is by any means the best movie of the three that we watched I I would personally say it was probably my least favorite to watch, but it also wasn't bad. So I think we're going to be a, a soft no on recommendation, perhaps. That that would be my opinion, probably, if you just want to like watch it for like, especially in terms of like entertainment value. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you want to enjoy the things you're watching. You, I mean, we don't have to be uh, stiff-necked, uh, politically politically correct in the in the classical sense. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, I just mean like somebody might be interested in it for like historical reasons or like political reasons or like if you just want to like watch movies about the Civil War from a different perspective. Yes, yeah, so it is by no means a bad movie. But let's move on to what I think is the best movie of this list. Uh, the Outlaw Josie Wales, released in 1976. Henry, if you would. Um, so it's a very interesting movie in that, like, it's kind of almost like a centrist or center-right uh, intersectionality. Like, I think, like, it being made in like the early to mid seventies and like kind of an Artur uh, 
time period where like in like of course like the 60s and 70s there was like a lot of like new film uh stuff going on and like new cultural ways to like make films like there were a lot of new schools being developed in filmographies so to speak and and like i think that kind of influences it and also like clint eastwood and like the other people involved in the movie it, it kind of feels like they're trying to bridge a lot of gaps that even like a lot of the new filmmakers of the 60s and 70s wouldn't have thought of to bridge so it, it's kind of like a confederate or like a neo-western movie like set during the civil war because it starts out in missouri but like they're traveling through like oklahoma in indian territory in that time period but oklahoma now and then to west texas and it, it's like kind of like a journey of a bunch of outcasts from all sorts of different groups like sort of like what people would say like marginalized groups or like the other i guess or like there's a lot of different ways there's a lot of different uh terms for them academic or otherwise that you could apply to them right well you could maybe say in a very general sense this is a pro-confederate movie or at least a movie sympathetic to a confederate character it is not the conventional confederate army that is portrayed uh sympathetically but an irregular unit and a member of an irregular unit that is really acting in revenge against union union uh, aligned irregulars that attack them uh the the titular uh Josie Wales uh has uh, has his farm attacked by pro unionists in Missouri and so joins a joins a band of uh of raiders who raid you know union outposts and pro union militias such as the ones who killed his uh, wife and child and um he fought he fights valiantly but at the end of the war um they are induced to surrender. Um, almost all of his unit goes to surrender. Um, he, I believe, is the only only man who who doesn't because his he's just got too much hate in his gut. He can't accept the Union surrender, and that hate in his gut actually saves him because, uh, as irregulars, they are not considered combatants protected by any any law either in the united states law or what existed at the time as international law and uh, his comrades are are massacred to a man except for the leader who sold them down the river so he begins this uh this crusade of um well at this point it's not much as much of a crusade as a uh as a flight away from from the Union Army, trying to track him down and kill him. Right. Yes. And uh, so, like he, and like you said, like it's irregulars in Missouri. There was like a lot of those. Like that was some of the worst irregular uh, warfare in the entire war, if not the worst. There were so many guerrilla bands, like Jesse James, the famous outlaw. He came out of that tradition. He was a, a Confederate or like Confederate sympathizing, like guerrilla, like anti union. And um, there were so many like outlaws, like of like Wild Western fame or like uh, in that time period in, in general. And and yes, and he, like you said, he flees. Like it's kind of like a weird mix. Like I would say more of a flight, but also like while he's like, flees, almost like on a crusade too like both like the against the people who are pur pursuing him and like just like evil doers like he's just like it's almost like he's like in that like goofy like 70s like tv show like karate or something like like kung fu like where that guy just like travels around america like fighting against evil doers like that's kind of a sidetrack but but yeah like every time like he's like faced with like 
like he just kind of like saves like innocent bystanders or like relatively innocent people from like people who are like violating them. It's kind of like it's kind of an interesting theme like to go along with him being uh persecuted by the union and like a lot of the people he's like helping obviously like like point out that they've been persecuted by like the US governments and like governments in general too like obviously the native american uh, indians and in the indian territory like they talk about how the union has or the US government has like repeatedly broken promises with them and like oppressed them for example Yeah, they're like, oh, it's said that the governments, all governments are led by the double tongues. Yeah, like, it, it is also funny, like, every every one of those, like, kind of, like, outcast people, there's sort of, like, a, like an underlying point there, right? Like, cut sort of in, in favor of, like, where the, uh, Josie Wales, like, idea of, like, resistance to the federal government. Yeah, like, of course, you got the natives, you got like settlers that were like screwed over by like federal like development and corruption. You got the the people who are about to be swindled by the carpetbagger, and he's like literally credited as carpetbagger in the movie. <laughs> the guy selling like whatever snake oil. Um, it is fun. Like the um, the Confederate ethos though of like Josie Wales has like nothing to do with uh slavery and it doesn't have that much to do with states rights either um it's more it's it's kind of just portrayed as like just anti-federal government like just like in general yeah um, it, and like yeah and like it's kind of like almost like fuck the man in general because like not only is it like sort of anarchic, but like it's also like kind of like uh, there's like a term I think from Ernst Junger or however you say it, like the anarch who just like which isn't necess which isn't about anarchism specifically, but it's like about somebody who like lives their life like apart from others in the sense like they sort of like walk to the tune of their own beat or like i don't know that's i i'm probably mangled the phrase there obviously but but just like yeah. somebody who uh who just like doesn't like follow along with like the expected like cultural expectations and obviously like as a member of like a guerrilla band like in a sense like he he wasn't protected like you said he wasn't protected from executions because he wasn't even officially part of the confederate army to begin with yeah uh a, a classic western anti-hero you know of the kind like you know the um the left uh really doesn't like the uh that like western trope of rugged individualism or whatever and I think it's worth pointing out that that was not always the the Western archetype. You know, the white hat was, you know, primarily the uh, the archetype for during the golden age of Westerns, right? And it was only in the 60s and 70s, you know, with the kind of like uh, revisionist, or not revisionist, uh, spaghetti Western style that you have like gray hats. And Clint Eastwood obviously... Uh, was a star of many of those, and he's kind of like, you know, in this case, he's uh, directing uh, himself as a as a prototypical gray hat in in more ways than one. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, the initial um, the initial director um, by the name of Kaufman, I forget his uh, his first name. But he um, he, he kind of like quit because he thought the the script was it's it was written by a quote crude fascist and then followed by the man's hatred of government was insane you know the the anti anti government fascism cough cough um cough Kaufman cough, cough. that's that yeah, that that's right thank you that was his name. Um, <laughs> 
But uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to, just to go back to, for a sec, uh, uh, the the book itself it has kind of an interesting history. The book that the movie was loosely uh, based on was written by a man who kind of overemphasized his like uh, I believe Cherokee a uh, blood to kind of write like basically like a a pro uh, pro Confederacy novel. Um, I believe the man uh, was like a supporter of uh, George Wallace and you know su Southern segregation, etc. Um, and it it is funny that like. A lot of uh, pro Confederate people are kind of like talk a lot about like, oh, the federal government was mean to like, to especially the Kit Cherokee, but other like tribes in Oklahoma because they sided with the, the Confederacy because they thought, uh, you know, the federal government was giving them a raw deal. Right. And, and that's uh, the elderly uh, Indian in the movie. Uh... He he points out that like he sided with the Confederacy and like most of his tribe and most of the tribes and in the Indian Territory in Oklahoma and just in general, like throughout the South and throughout the nation, uh, they tended to side with the Confederacy either explicitly or just as an anti-Union force that like uh, massacred like uh, Northern uh, troops, but um. Yeah, and I think his his name uh, his name is Wadey, like it's Wadey something, and that's obviously a nod, I'm pretty sure, to Stan Wadey, who is a Native American uh, fighter, I think a, a general in the Confederacy, like, and one of like the biggest leaders of the Cherokee. He was a Cherokee chief, I believe, and uh, he was uh, interesting historical trivia. He was actually the last. Confederate uh, general to surrender because uh, uh, his his command in the Indian territories so it, it surrendered even after uh, the Western Confederacy, like the the Trans Mississippi uh, Department, like that that was the last major department to surrender. But Stan Wadey surrendered even after that. So uh, yeah, he was the last Confederate general to surrender. Is that why the um... The Indian lands were the last to uh, emancipate their slaves. Um, I think so, or maybe because I think like maybe like it was either Delaware or Kentucky or Maryland. It was somewhere there was a Union states or or state that remained in the Union that emancipated their slaves after the Confederacy because like they only emancipated after the amendment passed or but also like the indian uh territory may have had like some unusual laws or like an unusual status obviously compared to like the other states so it may might have been some legal thing having to do with that i believe uh another thing related uh somewhat is like i think part of the reason why why uh in oklahoma like Oklahoma became a state and it probably would have happened anyway, but I don't think it would have happened to the degree that it did. Was well, so I think like the tribes that uh, rebelled against the union and sided with the Confederacy, they lost some of their rights as a result of that. Like, I think like uh, before they lost like the area around Oklahoma city, I think, and also like lost like full reservation status. Like they're starting to like, uh, get some of that back uh the supreme court had a ruling thanks to that, base gorsuch right neo gorsuch like and the uh, the supreme court like had a ruling that like is starting to you know give them like more full rights closer to like a full reservation uh but i think they lost some of those rights specifically as a result of uh siding with the confederacy actually It'd be funny if like a left wing left wing publication was like the dark history of of uh, <laughs> of the Oklahoma's Indians and why the Supreme Court is actually bad for doing this. That would be that would be very interesting. If, like that would be a very funny article. Yes, if they printed something like that. 
why Gorsuch is evil for this. Yeah, for this one. I remember people were like really surprised that he was like, uh, that he did that. You know, really yeah, in that, favor of the tribes. Yeah, they they think he's woke, but really he's just a evil racist neo Confederate. <laughs> That's right. All right. Uh, any anything else you can think of worth talking about in this? Uh... Sure. Well, I I think it's interesting. Like, like I know I already said this, but like there really is a odd intersectionality like because even later on like like it even extends to like non-confederate or confederate sympathizing people because like basically there's a couple from kansas jay hawker or not a couple but uh a two people an elderly woman and i think her granddaughter a young woman uh who are from kansas and who are like fiercely patriotic like a uh, or like about Kansas and the Union and the Northern United States and like hates Missourians because like of all like the partisan warfare, guerrilla warfare between like the Kansas Jayhawkers and the Missouri Bushwhackers or the various Confederate groups in Missouri. And uh Eastwood like ends up like defending them from like uh a band that wants to like violate the younger woman or like take her to like their leader who would I guess uh like they want to like i guess like as like a rape victim i guess and and like clint eatswood like stops this like terrible acts and like protects them and like eventually like he gets even like the old elderly lady who's like fiercely anti like missourian to like her like him despite the fact that he was a confederate like missourian like bushwhacker type and uh it's it's really like it's kind of like, like it's almost like they're building like an anarchic society out in the middle of like nowhere in West Texas, in the middle of Comanche territory. That's another part. Like they're going to like have to go to war with like the wild Comanches, but like he manages to convince them that he's like an honorable man and has like a blood pact with them, and that like the fact that like. Like, he doesn't need to, like, sign a treaty with them. He doesn't need a formal piece of paper. It's, like, a plus for him. Like, because, like, they say, like, like, bonds, written bonds, like, are always broken by the U.S. government. But you can trust, like, a man with a gun, like, and a blood pact and a handshake to, like, be truthful and honorable. So, like, and it, it's kind of like they almost have, like, a commune. <laughs> like a hippie commune except like it's like somewhat like center or like right wing coded but like they sort of have like a, a commune in out in the middle of nowhere like it's like very like al alternative in a sense like an alternative lifestyle with like an elderly indian man a young indian woman who he also saved earlier in the film uh from like assault or like potential sexual assault uh, an elderly like kansas woman a younger kansas woman and then like clint eastwood like a confederate or ex-confederate so like it's kind of like an an odd group like it's almost like in a sense like it almost feels like kind of unrealistic that like this could even happen but uh, it, it's like a work of fiction like it's like focused on odd and like an oddball narrative and oddball characters so like Sure, like theoretically, it could have happened. You ever seen the movie Kelly's Heroes? I don't think so. No. So it's it's another movie uh, starring uh, Clint Eastwood. It's about a um, American soldiers sort of going AWOL to like capture Nazi gold for themselves against like they're fighting the Germans and trying to stay ahead of like the rest of the American forces. Who, like confiscate the gold oh i think it. i have seen this movie actually yeah that's a good movie if I, it's the one i'm thinking of it has donald sutherland in it and donald sutherland is like okay so like clint eastwood is portrayed as a kind of like what he is in the, this movie he's kind of like a, a rough writer that doesn't quite play by the rules or whatever um and then donald sutherland is like the guy that like he uh like he offers like to like work on this base this heist and Donald Sutherland uh commands like a tank platoon 
and they're like a free love like hippie like thing but they work together because of like their mutual interest um it, it just kind of reminds like you know in the 70s uh we're full of these kind of like screwball comedies where this like this like uh, ragtag group of misfits or whatever and you know it's a classic i mean even star wars is kind of like this too um but yeah um a fun movie worth watching and also has very uh based underlying political and cultural ideas right uh can i say the ending if that be okay or uh we'll we'll just say spoilers and then yeah you yeah yeah spoiler alert uh from what i remember like if it's the movie i'm thinking of like at the end like like oh of, uh, Ke- of kelly's heroes right yes yeah. so at the end of that movie like like they just like decide to blow up the vault together or whatever and like they both like take like billions oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. of dollars they literally ally with like the the ss panzer uh division like tank commander yeah and i think they were like this like group was like fighting with each other like until like very recently but like at the end like they sort of realized like the war's over like it's time to get our spoils like there's no reason not to or something yeah a very a very based movie and yeah kind of like subtly anti-war almost or you know like one of the another one of the heroes is like this corrupt like quartermaster that basically sets up the heist itself. Like, right. Yeah. I it, mean, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like oddly like touching and humanizing in a way. Like obviously, like probably like loads of like the people were like terrible people. Especially obviously the SS, especially like they they were all probably or most of them were probably like very bad people. But it, it's also sort of like oddly touching in a way. From what I remember of. Yeah, peace is good, baby. Sure, yeah. And I don't know, I guess like another interesting thing, and we've like alluded to it or like basically said it or mentioned it a lot, but it's interesting that Josie Wales like focuses on like three trans Mississippi areas, like and in some ways like some of the more iconic trans Mississippi areas, like um Obviously, Missouri, uh, the Indian Territory, and Texas, Texas, all of which had like very unusual experiences during the Civil War compared to like the places people usually think like Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, like those type of places. Like, obviously, like they were like near the frontier or like out in the frontier and and like had like less troops and like everything was like organized like much less uh tightly and right it was it was more about like mobile warfare and you know cavalry units and stuff like that. right yes and also uh like the lines could be very messy messy particularly in missouri obviously where like there were tons of partisans like on both sides like behind enemy lines Yeah, I mean it's it's a good it's a good place to set a sort of like a half western, half uh, civil war movie. Right. Yeah. So like, and like West Texas, like, and particularly like the area where it looks like it's set in West Texas, it, it's kind of like on the border between like Comanche lands and like, like I guess like the the frontier, like the Anglo anglo-spanish frontier so it's like really in the middle of like a lot of different areas or like or beyond like the jurisdiction of like most governments so like it also ends in like sort of an anarchic area yeah well any more thoughts um i think that's about it would you recommend outlaw josie whale Oh sure, it, it's it's a good movie. Yes, I would recommend it. Yeah, I think I think it's a very good movie, it, very enjoyable. Just on like a pure uh, entertainment value, um, fun, and like, again, just like Kelly's Heroes uh, has some some great uh, kind of like uh, fodder for for libertarians. You know, it's a, it's an individualist 
it's an anti-establishment uh, movie and very politically incorrect. Yes, especially now. Like even back then, it would have been, but like now, it's like probably more politically incorrect than how it would have been perceived in the 70s when it was made, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. It could have been made today, bro. But, yeah, but for real. Yeah, and I, I guess, like, theoretically it could have been made, but, like, as an indie film with, like, a smaller budget, probably. <laughs> yeah, well, speaking of uh, small independent movies, uh, we have our third and final film, Copperhead, which was made way back in the far off year of 2013. So uh, let's uh, let's talk about that. Uh, yeah. So it's like the name refers to like a historical group, of course, the Copperheads, like Northern Peace Democrats who opposed the American Civil War. Like they were most common along the border states or like uh, Union states that uh, bordered the Confederacy. But there was also like a lot of them in like upstate New York or like New York City. Like there was a, a decent amount throughout the country, like even if they were like tended to be focused further south on average. And uh, the movie like focuses on the northern home front and like particularly on uh, the tension between like anti-war or neutral uh, Democrats, copperheads, if you will, in uh, upstate New York and like the rest of the town, which is mostly almost overwhelmingly, like seemingly a Republican town, a pro-war town. Well, uh, they are certainly now, right? Um, but as the, um, as the patriarch, of of the uh, the farmstead, it, 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 very similar structure at least uh, in terms of like the setting, setting the story. Uh, Abner, forget what his his last name is, but we'll go with just Abner. He notes that um, in eighteen fifty two and eighteen fifty six, um, the county uh, went for the Democrats, and then suddenly they uh, they went for Republicans, and now everyone is like this. Uh, is bang for war and suddenly be, has become like a Republican, it seems almost overnight. Right. Yes. I was going to bring that up too, which is very interesting. Like I'm sure there were probably towns like that or even counties like that, but I, I, I didn't do this like, but I meant to like that made me want to look up which County this was set in, or if it was meant to be a specific County or explicitly said, because like, Sure, that that did happen in areas of the country, but that is a very interesting phenomenon, and like particularly that like because like the the town really is portrayed like it makes it seem like sixty, seventy, eighty percent of the town is like pro war or like even pro republican, and that like I guess like some people are like hiding or maybe like just changed because like they didn't want to get like bullied or harassed, but like it really does make it seem like. There's only like a few, like maybe like a half dozen or like a, a few dozen people in this entire town that are Democrats, it seems like. Yeah. Um, so this Abner guy, I mean, he's he's a copperhead. Now, a lot of copperheads, uh, especially in the border states, were kind of pro-slavery, especially in places like Illinois, Indiana even Ohio. Um, but he is not really that concerned about slavery. He doesn't want to expand slavery. Uh, he doesn't like slavery. He says he even opposed the annexation of Texas in 1845. I assume just because he was like concerned about the, the effects that would have on like the slate, like slavery in the United States. Um, most of the time he's talking about like the constitutional like the constitution the survival of the constitution and uh, the you know deleterious effects the war is having and lincoln is having on the constitution you know throwing journalists in jail uh conscripting men 
into fighting, um, you know, various other measures that he disagrees with. Right, and I would guess, uh, like, like, yeah, like, I think there's, like, an implication, maybe, or you could certainly guess that, like, he's concerned about, like, uh, the annexation of Texas uh, to the Union, its effects on slavery. I would also guess that, like, probably just as much of a concern, if not even more of a concern, is, like, he he was probably concerned about, like, the somewhat irregular uh, nature which, like, Texas became the state constitutionally. like. I think like there there were disputes about like and I think like you could argue that uh it's just like outright true that like like you can't annex a territory and like make it a state legally like that to just like automatically become a state like upon annexation like of course like there were the northwest ordinances and like various procedures that was like the regular procedure on how to become a state not like immediately upon annexation um yeah but like i i liked this movie a lot i think like i feel like it punches above it, its weight like i think it has like a really good like like emotional narrative in a sense like in some ways it's like kind of stereotypical i guess or like fairly formulaic but i feel like i felt like it did it really well uh uh as like obviously like as the movie i mean there, there's an interesting character like one of the most important characters uh he's sort of like a stalwart republican like a true republican who's like always been a republican who like the democrats respect like they they're like uh i think the irish democrat like irish immigrants uh uh like says about like how and i think like the main copperhead like patriarch like talk about how they respect that like he's always thought that way at least he's principled even if he's like can be rude or like kind of a jerk or or like kind of a scoundrel or whatever at least he's always thought this and like really believes in like everything he's saying and like a true republican unlike uh the many who have like converted just because out of social pressure or because like they're they're in the war scene yeah, um, and um, that guy, I'm blanking on uh, his name, but yeah, like the the um, the son of Abner's love interest is um, that guy's daughter, and um, he's a you know he's a staunch abolitionist. He's very like pious, uh, pietist as well, and kind of like it's a very it's a very good like character study, right? Of like the average like really firebrand republican you know he's also into temperance he he sees the civil war as a religious crusade and as the war goes on he becomes more and more uh fervent about that and you know less willing to you know put uh people's emotions or even people's uh in consideration uh, when it comes to like what he believes is like the right thing to do. Sure, and as just as a footnote or side note, uh, most people listening to this probably would know this, but temperance here means uh, abstaining from alcohol or being anti-alcohol. Even the temperance movement, of course. Yes, and ultimately, you know, the the forces that led to prohibition in the 20th century. Right, yes, exactly. And um they tended to be like northern Yankee Republicans, like Protestant Republicans especially, like and uh they often like it, it kinda coupled nicely with the Republican Party being the relatively speaking, the anti immigrant party, the anti Catholic you could say I guess anti Catholic party in the sense or like at least like uh the party with less catholics more protestants of course like the democrats were majority protestant as well but like a much larger percentage of democrats were catholics and, yes uh, it, immigrants and it's not exact it's not it you know well it does a good job it doesn't lay it on too thick but for example there's an there's a pretty obviously irish character who is uh friends slash uh i believe they're like co-workers or at least employees of abner 
Right. Um, and they're, they're Irish. They're, they b- agree with Abner about like being like true blue Democrats. Um, and, you know, he's there's a couple moments where there's there's a bit of like an anti-immigrant uh, sentiment among the Republicans. He's ref- he's refused initially, at least uh, the right to vote because his naturalization papers are seen as, quote unquote, not in order, even though before they were perfectly fine. Um, he's made fun of as a as a drunkard, which, to be honest, he does like a, a drop with the crather. But, um, you know, there's kind of like a uh, uh, anti-Irish stereotyping and prejudice uh, that's sort of like right under the surface. Uh, sure, the yeah. Time, it, it, so. It's obviously like a sort of racial or ethnic jibe of sorts. Like, yes, like it's obviously referring to the fact that he's Irish. And yes, uh, during the 1862 New York state election, uh, they initially refuse him, like you said, and like despite the fact he voted in previous elections with the exact same papers. Obviously, uh, like tensions have gotten to the point where they're like trying to prevent people from voting, especially uh, Democrats and Irish Democrats, uh, immigrant naturalized Democrats. It's also um, the story with Abner's son. Um, he he sort of like goes along with his dad's like anti-war beliefs or like or like not wanting to join the military but i think like he wants the respect of the town obviously and like i think he wants the respect of his like prospective like father who obviously like like his his father-in-law disparages his family and him all the time and like tells his daughter that like oh if you marry him it will be the death of me he he will kill me so like I think, like, obviously, like, or at least to me, obviously, the reason he joins the army is, like, to, like, impress impress his father-in-law, impress his, like, potential future wife, like, his, like, kind of pseudo-fiancé or girlfriend, impress the town in general. And, like, it's interesting because the the feeling I got was that, like, I think his girlfriend actually didn't really want him to go. Like, it's kind of just like a sudden thing that he decides that, like, I think he thinks she wants him or, like, the town wants him to go. But, like, the sense I got was that, like, she's kind of like, oh, you shouldn't do that to your family. You should you should stay or, like, you should at least, like, notify them in a better way. Like, it, it kind of hinted to me that, like, she didn't really want to see him go to the war. Yeah, she's kind of portrayed as not really knowing what to think, like being between like you know the man that she's in love with and her father. Like she's very conflicted about it. Yeah, I, I I feel like she she is a Republican, but like she's not nearly as Republican as her dad is. Obviously, it feels like she broadly supports the North and like maybe the war effort, but like she doesn't personally want her like her like love to die and like it feels like she doesn't want him to join because of that and yeah. and also she's obviously much more open minded because later on like she says like she's been surreptitiously like reading Abner's opinions or like news articles or something and like while he while she she's honest enough to like she says while I still disagree with your opinions like I can understand why you have yours now or something which like her father would never say, obviously. Yeah, Abner is portrayed as having like a large like he's he's like a skeptic and a scholar. <laughs> like in, in many ways, he's a lot like the patriarch in uh, Shenandoah. Like he's sort of like a yeoman, like philosopher. Like he he's like you were named after Thomas Jefferson or whatever, right? Like he's he's sort of like a kind of like Enlightenment thinker, like pro constitution, pro like civil liberties. Sure, of. right. And I think in, in some ways, like and I think this like has like multiple reasons for it, like like probably because it's like kind of more of like relatively an indie movie labor of love thing in some ways, like relatively speaking compared to the times lower budget and uh and like also like a more recent I feel like in many ways like this movie is like the most in some senses the most historically realistic or at least like 
the most likely movie in the terms of like the characters aren't like they're more like what the average person would have been like i think because like like a copperhead democrat while like slightly unusual isn't that unusual at all uh in new york and also like the fact that like he's he's not pro slavery is like pretty realistic given that he's in the upstate new york where like there aren't e even any slaves to be had it's illegal yeah i think they they do a good job uh the setting being like realistic historically accurate you know it a lot of it centers on literally the 1862 new york gubernatorial election which is kind of like a funny thing to think of as like oh what would make a good movie Right, you know, exactly. But, like I was going to bring that up. Like it's like imp it's like has like an impressive uh eye for detail. Like like that obviously isn't like something that like people think about a lot during the Civil War. In fact, like it barely probably doesn't even have like that much online resources about the eighteen sixty two New York election. But yes, uh like it, it's interesting, despite the town or county or whatever, like being Republican, uh, New York as a whole, uh, it actually like there's a clean sweep. It's a narrow victory, but all the statewide, uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, all the statewide offices are all won by Democrats or or Copperhead uh, people. Yeah, even the uh, the commissioner of state prisons and then Abner's like, maybe we can free some of those unjustly, you know, imprisoned people who are just being pro-peace. Right, and uh, and election day is a great scene because, uh, like, the three of them, like, uh, Abner, uh, the Irish guy, and I think the Irish guy's son, who's, like, kind of short and goofy looking, uh, they they kind of, like, like march out as base libertarian rationalist skeptics like and like it's just kind of funny because they have like the blue uh, democrat uh, labels and and they just like kind of look goofy especially like the young short guy and um uh, and they they end up having to fight at the ballot like like in this, like after the Irish guys denied uh, the right to vote, like they get into a fight about it because like he like presses the issue and like demands to be able to vote, and they get into a fight with like probably like six, seven, eight plus uh, Republican guys, and like but they put up enough of a fight that like somebody else like takes, like they get like I guess one of the higher ups or like one of the older or more respectable like like man with like more integrity and less fight um like they they accept the irish guys vote eventually i guess like arguably because they were willing to put up a fight at the ballot on election day yeah it looks like uh one democrat is worth at least three re republicans that's right brother that's right so yeah so uh yes mr horatio seymour becomes governor of new york but uh, unfortunately, in retaliation for this, the the Republicans, the the pro-war people in the county slash in the community, uh, basically like form at least initially is going to be a lynch mob, trying to get the uh, the Democrats to come out and like fight them, and I guess be killed perhaps or seriously injured. Right, seriously beaten maybe. Um, but they leave eventually, they get bored, and there's, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's 100% clear that this is a total accident, but in any case, there's, like, a fire that, like, burns down, like, Abner's homestead. Yeah, but, it's somewhat ambiguous, but to me, it seemed, like, maybe intentional, at least by, like, one of them, like, one or two of them maybe were, like, had a mean spirit to them still, even after the less were willing to leave. Yeah, but, uh, you know, and this is a problem, obviously, for Abner, but also for the uh, the Republican leader, because his his daughter was it was staying at their house because, of course, she's uh, like engaged to uh, Abner's son. And. Um, uh, the, the fire, the fire creates this impression that they, they can't find. 
the daughter and um the uh the yeah. republican becomes so like you know emotionally distressed that that he uh that he acts and um i mean i don't want to spoil everything i guess spoiler alert but um you know he he dies he dies by his own hand and uh his son, who is interestingly, you know, I, maybe we should talk a little bit more about uh, the, the the Republican side is actually a lot more of an independent thinker, right? Uh, than maybe any of the other. Well, Abner, Abner, and Re and the Republican uh, are, I guess, their own men. But um, Republican son is uh, pretty still adamantly anti-war, despite having a father who is, like, pro-war and is called yeah. like a disappointment. I mean, I would say, like, uh, the Republican son is, like, the most interesting character in that regard, or, or like, the most free-thinking. Obviously, like, Abner, like, has, like, pretty well-thought-out beliefs, and, like, they're somewhat uh, idiosyncratic to a degree. But, like, obviously, he, he very much has, like, firm opinions and, like, doesn't seem to, like, be willing and and not that that's a bad thing of course that can be a very good thing but like he doesn't seem necessarily to be willing to consider the other side as much like he doesn't seem to like think about like the republican view that much except against like why he's against it or like why it's wrong like the republican son like he's like in a sense like a true quote free thinker in that like he doesn't have like firm beliefs or ideological opinions that like he's firmly committed to so much, at least like not publicly, at least like he doesn't care about uh, like expounding about the maybe, maybe he does have firm beliefs, but like he doesn't care about like uh, publicly having ideological battles or like fights against people in general about them. And uh, I don't know. He seems like a very interesting character to me like the way that he's kind of like free floating and like willing to consider everyone yeah and i would say his um his eulogy for his father at the end um uh, there's not a lot of ideology there there's there's a certain sense of religion and loving thy neighbor and like how do we like actually do that right and like we need to start doing that again etc and like the war is not loving thy neighbor um, right. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're just in a loop. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're in the NPC loop. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, NPC podcast loop. But yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. No. But uh. Oh, what was I even going to say? Uh. Oh, yes, like, your points, uh, it's a good point, I think. Like, the fact that he has, like, such a stalwart Republican father and is in a Republican town, like, the fact that he's not, like, he, he he's willing to go beyond that. Like, of course, we don't know what Abner's background is, but, like, it kind of feels like perhaps he was brought up in a Democratic family. Perhaps. We don't know, obviously, for sure. Or... There's no like direct indication of that besides like gasoline. Yeah, I mean it's hard. You know, farm. He's a farmer. Farmers are generally speaking, at least you know, all things being equal, they tend they tended more towards Democrats, right, right and more industrialists. It is funny that the Republican is the owner of a uh, a lumber mill, right? He is sort of like a primitive like capitalist like he's a capital owner yeah or like uh in the sense of primitive industrialist yeah yeah um that scene by the way the the sequence of like how the uh mill works is pretty cool i'm sure they had to like they had to like rent out like one of those like real like authentic like those people like that larp as like you know in the <laughs> right. 18th century but yeah. it's a, it's a fun sequence you know sh showing like you know how like the 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 water mills like pulling and you know these intricate like mechanical movements is like pulling the uh the logs and like being chopped up yeah no you know? yeah no it's pretty cool it's pretty aesthetic as well and it like adds flavor 
it adds like historical flavor and like detail to a movie. It's 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 good, yeah. A little bit of flavor. <laughs> right. Yeah, a little bit of flavor. All I right, would say well, like this, this movie like exceeded my expectations the most, I think, of the three. I think it's a very watchable movie. In um and certainly it's like we said, the most historically uh based and red pilled. No, but historically based <laughs> on like, you know, like bait like like this could have happened or you know, and this like here's here's our here here is an interesting historical scenario. Uh, right. Played out. Sure, yeah, and it, it's like the most like like attention to detail in a sense. Like uh, of course Josie Wales has like a lot of interesting details, but like it, it's not focused on like actual real life events like the eighteen sixty two New York governor's election, for example. But yeah. Um it, the Republican Sun is also interesting in that like it's kind of crazy. I guess it's like this is probably like the craziest or like quote most unrealistic part of the movie, arguably. But like it, I think it's pretty realistic. I think this did happen. Like it's not that crazy. Like the fact that he's like he wants to like go down to the south in the middle of the war to like find find uh, where uh, the Abner's uh, son is. Which is like a crazy thing to do, obviously, but like really, I think shows like the free spirited nature of him and like just willing to like consider his creativity and like willing to do things and consider things that like other people aren't able to. And he's also like tries to reconcile, uh, reconcile Abner with his son, who like Abner's like at least a little bit up. He's pretty upset about the fact that his son went went to fight in the Union Army and like. He's like trying to convince him to like reconcile with him and also like maybe like fund him on this adventure uh, to like go down south. Which like Abner like almost wants to like he like respects him and like like says he's a good boy, but like he just can't quite do it. But like he says like you you can fill your pockets with as much apples as you care to. Yeah, it's it is funny that like. Uh... Abner's son and the Republican son friendship seems to be like the most solid of any of the bonds in the entire movie, right? Like, because both Abner and the Republican, um, their bonds with their family are kind of contingent on whether or not they agree with them or not. Right. Yes. Yeah. Although like, I, yeah, I, like I, I will that's, say that's some. Kind of... oh. I will just before I forget this point. Sure. Um, when we're talking about like the. Like him, like trying to like get uh get Abner's son out. I do think it it is important to remember that like pre modern uh like warfare and like the role like like prison and the role and status that prisoners had was was really not the same as it it as it was like for example during the First World War and beyond. Like there was a sense in like prisoners of war were at least uh on paper considered like almost guests and sort of but also sort of like ransoms and so like the the idea that a private citizen would be able to like get like a soldier released is a lot more believable yeah, during the civil war than it is now obviously oh no no i totally agree and i think like that obviously that did happen and like it, it's like realistic i just mean that I, I mostly meant that in the sense where it's like like it like it's an unusual or like crazy thing to do, even though it did happen and like people did do it. But like the fact and also that he's so young too. Like I think like that ordinarily would have like somebody doing that would probably be older and more established and wealthier. Yeah, for sure. But yes, um, uh, yeah, there was actually we watched uh, that movie together, and there was that's uh, an another point like closely related to that is that like generally like the further back you go, like there well it depends on the conflict, but a lot of times like like uh, in the Civil War as compared to like a lot of more recent wars, like it would have been easier 
for you to escape imprisonment too because like it was sort of like it was less modern in the sense where like everything's not as like tightly controlled as it would be now yeah absolutely and and also that's another like it it'd probably be easier to like get behind the lines in some ways as compared to like some other more recent conflicts as well well that's for sure right yeah All right, so you would recommend uh, Copperhead? I, I would recommend it personally, yes. Yeah, I think it's worth. I think it's worth seeing. Like in some ways, like it was almost as enjoyable to me as like Josie Wales was. Mm -hmm. It's high praise. All right. Well, unless you have uh, any parting thoughts, maybe we'll uh, start wrapping this up. Um, no, I don't think I have any, no, really. All right, well, um, we hope that you listeners in enjoyed us exploring these three not-so-well-known Civil War movies, and we hope you would consider watching them, or at least the ones that we recommended, although really all three of them have merit. Um, so um, this has been Adrian Shepard with my friend Henry. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, all right. We'll. Uh... <laughs> all right. <clears throat> um, cough, 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 cough. Uh, yeah. Cough, cough, Kaufman. Kaufman. Um, Charlie Kaufman. Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman. Um, all right. Yes. Well, uh, let's let's end this before it gets too uh, out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> May a thousand flowers bloom. <laughs> <laughs>